Hi guys and welcome to this video on matching and allocation problems, part of our Further Maths course. My name is Darren, welcome, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me. Um, what are we doing today? Well, we're going to look at understanding what a bipartite graph is, understanding what a directed bipart graph is, Woo, and a complete bipart weighted bipart graph is. But interestingly, don't worry, you've already got this information. Now, if you've already watched the previous videos, nothing to worry about, you are ready for this. If you haven't watched the previous videos, why not head to mathsguru.com where you can download the notes, watch the videos, it's all there for you, time codes, blah, 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 lots, exam questions, and so much more coming. I'll let your mates know, greatly appreciated. Then we're going to go and apply the Hungarian algorithm. Yes, I love the Hungarian algorithm. Just when you thought it was safe and you've learned all the language, now nah, there's three more things you need to know about, right? So we spend a lot of time looking at graphs and networks and digraphs, and we've looked at, you know, flow problems and connector problems and Prim's algorithms, and <laughs> it just goes on. There is a lot here. But it's all been building towards the stuff we're, we're going to do in this particular chapter. All right? So if you are following along with the Cambridge textbooks, awesome. Thanks very much, Cambridge, for allowing me to use your examples. You guys literally rock. All right? So let's look at some more language. This one here is called a bipartite graph. And basically, it's sort of, you can imagine like sporting teams. You know, you've got players here on the left who are, play, who are competing against players here on the right. Yes, now because... Um, there are connections between each of the players on the left to each of the players on the right, or there are connections starting, then these are called bipartite graphs. You do not, in this situation, have to have Jenny join play everybody. In this situation, Jenny played Lisa. End of. Now, Jenny may have lost to Lisa, which is why Roger then played Lisa. So that's what that means. It could also mean that Lisa played both Jenny and Roger. There's no direction on this graph at all. I wonder if there's going to be a directed one of these oh, coming up. But the point of it is, this just shows how two teams have competed against each other. End of. And it is called a bipartite graph. Bi meaning two. All right, so two parts of my graph. Thank you. Job done. What do we do now? Oh my goodness, a directed bipart graph. What is a directed bipart graph? Mm -hmm. It's a bipart graph that is directed. So now there is only one way for this direction to happen, right? So obviously in this situation, we have music teachers. In on the right of my diagram, I have the musical instruments that they play, right? And it makes sense that David is teaching the trumpet. Yes, that's why that little arrow points that David teaches the trumpet and in fact, he teaches the flute. It doesn't make sense to say that the trumpet played David. That's a whole new world we don't want to think about, yes? Or the flute played David. So in this situation, that's a directed bipart graph because those directions give some sort of order and understanding to what is happening and sense, really. Oh, there we go. The word complete. Now remember, we've already met complete before for complete graphs and a complete weighted bipart graph just puts all of those things together. Complete. One point is connected to all other points. Now in this situation, the reason it's called a complete weighted by part graph is probably because the information for the weights is, is, is kept off. Now, in a minute, we're gonna have examples that actually give weights to each of these arrows. It'll help us work out sort of other problems using this Hungarian algorithm, right? But again, it's complete because all the points are joined to all the other points. It's weighted because they will have weights bipartite and it's also directed because it's got some sort of direction in this situation an employee can use a machine the machine can't use the employee all right so notice how that sort of makes no sense when i say it the other way around okay here is the hungarian algorithm and it is just a process of steps and my advice to you is you copy it in to your summary book and you follow it through Okay, the Hungarian algorithm has a number of stages and these are followed religiously step by step. So subtract the lowest value in each row from every value in each row, okay. If the minimum number of lines required to cover all the zeros in the table is equal to the number of allocations to be made, jump to step six, otherwise continue step three. I can continue reading these. Let's actually do an example, all right? So here we go. We've got some employees, A, B, C, and D. Um, Wendy, the table below shows four employees, Wendy and the machines in a factory, all right? So the employee was Wendy, Xenophon, Yolanda, and Zelda, and the machines they can operate is A, B, C, and D. All right, so what are the numbers? The numbers in the table, the time in minute it takes each employee to finish a task. So those are the weighted sections of the graph. Question says, uh, the table is called a cost matrix. What it wants us to do is try and basically work out which employee is best to use which machine. And the way we use that is the Hungarian algorithm. So 
We're going to start off with step number one, subtract the lowest value in each row from every value in each row. And that should have a row in it. All right. So what we're going to do is draw it back out very quickly. So I'm going to do W, X, Y, and Z, and we've got A, B, C, and D. All right. So we're going to subtract the lowest number the lowest value in each row from every value in each row. Okay, so if we look at Wendy's row, the lowest is 30, so we're gonna take away 30 from each of those numbers, 10, 20, and 30. So 0, 10, 20, 30. Right, let's look at Xenophon, what's her lowest number is 30, so take away 30 from each of those gives 40, 0, uh, 10, and 40, yep. I'm just checking, make sure I got this right. Yep, Y is 30, is the lowest, take away 30, take away 30, take away 30, and we get zero. And 20 is the lowest there, so zero, 60, 30, and 40. All right, so if the minimum number of lines required to cover all the zeros in the table is equal to the number of allocations to be made, jump to sec six. So because we're making four allocations, if we can cover these in four lines, then we're good to go. So let's see what the minimum number of lines are. Right, so I could do one, two, three, four. I could go horizontally through this, um, and that would give me four lines, but we've got to find the minimum way of doing it. And as it turns out, there is a smaller way. There's one through there, one through there, and one through there. Yeah, even if we did it horizontally, then we're pretty much, um, and it can be horizontally or vertically, it doesn't actually matter, yes, or a combination of both, but three lines. So the question says, is the minimum number of lines required to cover all the zeros in the table equal to the number of allocations? It isn't. Sheesh. Step three, if a column does not contain a zero, subtract the lowest value in that column from every value in that column. Oosh. So I'm going to draw another version of the table here, and you're going to say, really, you've got to keep drawing these tables? Well, I am at this moment in time. What do we have? W x y and z we've got a b c and d right here we go so did what does it say if a column does not contain a zero subtract the lowest value in that column all right so column c doesn't have a zero in it so i'm going to have to tra subtract 10 because that's my smallest value there so that's going to become 10 0 20 and 20 all the other numbers stay the same so we've got 0 40 30 and 0 what do we got there 10 0 20 and 60, what do we have there? 30, 40, zero, and 40. What does it say, step four? If the minimum number of lines required to cover, right? So we do that again. So I got one, two, three, four, one, two, three. So again, my minimum actually is one through here, one through there, and one through there. So again, that's three lines. Oh, is the minimum number of lines required to cover all the zeros in the table equal to the number of allocations? It isn't. Step 5a. Add the smallest uncovered number to any value that is covered by two lines. Add the smallest uncovered number to any value that is covered by two lines. All right, so we've got values covered by two lines here and here. We want the smallest uncovered number, which appears to be 10. So it says, subtract the smallest uncovered number from all the uncovered numbers. Okay, Whew. so I'm going to draw it again. All right, so all of the uncovered numbers. So that means that anything that's got a line through it stays the same. What's that going to be? 30, 40, 0, and 40. And they're going to stay as two zeros. We said 10 was the lowest number, so we're now going to subtract 10 from everything. So that gives me 0 and 0, 10 and 10. 50 and 10. Right, let's do the line thing. Smallest number of lines to draw. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. I'm fairly sure. 1, 2, 3, 4. That's certainly one way of doing it. And as a result, ladies and gentlemen, we are now done with that. What are we going to do with that information? We're now going to turn that into a bipartite graph. That's the whole point of doing the Hungarian algorithm. I did mention that, didn't I? No, I didn't. This is the whole point of doing this. So what we do is, before we go on, it says draw a directed bitart graph with an edge for every zero value in the table. All right, so draw a directed bitart graph for every zero edge there is in the table. All right, and what happens is, there we go, ladies and gentlemen, we've turned this into 
All right, so everywhere there is a zero, we have to draw an edge. We already know we've got W, X, Y, and Z, A, B, C, and D. So those are the two sides of my bipartite graph. So Wendy has a connection to A, B, C, because there are zeros in Wendy as A, B, and C. So what we notice is Wendy's got a connection to A, to B, and to C. Right, X has got a connection to B and C. Y has a connection only to D. And Z has a connection only to A. Now, why is this important to us? Because then we can work out who runs which machine, okay? Because if we now notice Yolandi, or Yolanda, sorry, because I know a Yolandi, Yolanda can only operate machine D. She's the only machine she can operate as per this information, because it's the number of minutes, it's the quickest time. Zelda, it would appear, can only do machine A. So Wendy can't do A. Wendy could choose B, or Wendy could choose C. And in fact, Xenophon could choose B and Xenophon could choose C as well. Now, because that's a case of either of them, yes, we would then go back and look at the times. The reason I've written these numbers on is because we need to try and work out are the costs the same. And generally speaking, they are. If Wendy operates machine B, then Xenophon would have to operate machine C. So those 40 and 40 would have to give 80. If we did it the other way, what do you notice about the 30 and the 50? They make 80 as well. So there's no time saving or cost saving in either of those. So Wendy or Xenophon can operate either machine. So let's say Wendy's going to operate B and Xenophon's going to operate C. How do we then work out the costs? We effectively now say, well, Wendy's operating machine B, uh, Xenophon is operating machine C, Yolande is operating machine D, and Zelda is operating machine A. So those there are my costs, which when we add them all together will give me the total cost of, or the minimum cut, or whatever else you want to call it, with regards to running this system in the most efficient possible way. So 40, 80, 80, 90, 100, 110, 130. So because they stood for minutes, it would be 130 minutes. And there we go, that's the end of this question. Hopefully that's made sense. Yes, go back through the Hungarian algorithm, look at it, practice it, play. There's lots of questions in the Cambridge book. If you haven't used the Cambridge textbook for further maths, it's phenomenal. So many questions, really well written and um, really, really helpful. Thank you very much again, Cambridge. Um, subscribe, like, tell your mates, um, and hopefully I'll see you back in another video. You take care, guys. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Yes, this is the end of another video. If you haven't already done so, can you click on my subscribe button? Yes, it doesn't mean anything other than the fact that I know that you are watching. Yes, it's greatly appreciated. Otherwise, I feel like I'm sitting here just talking to myself. And then, yes, there is mathsguru.com, of which you can see a still of now. And what is over there? Well, all the videos ordered by textbook, ordered by topic. You can search for the videos. You can download notes time codes, exam questions, and so, so much more coming up. Yeah, it's absolutely free to join. So I'm done. Thank you very much. I hope to see you in another video. Give me a shout out to your mates if you can. I just want to make sure that everyone finds maths interesting and easy. All right, take care, guys. See you again. Bye-bye. Stay safe.